All right, sorry for the delay. Let's start with prayer and we'll go right into our study. We only have two pages tonight. I intend on finishing. So let's start with prayer and we'll go right into our passage and then we'll go into our study. Let us pray. Father, as always, we are grateful when we can assemble together around your word, whether in person or online. We know that this is the way to do it. We are exposed to Bible doctrine and it allows us to have the mind of Christ and acquire the mind of Christ, thus allowing us to make adjustments in our lives when necessary and where necessary. I pray now that as we look into your word that you would help us through the agency of God, the Holy Spirit, to see what's there and to see what's not there. But before we do... The rebound technique comes to mind, which is 1 John 1, 9, which says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we'll all just pause for a moment of silence and exercise 1 John 1, 9 if necessary, and then I'll open with prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this time. We commit ourselves each and every week to know you more through the scriptures. There's no other way to do so. And so as we commit our time with thee, I pray that if there's anything vying for our attention, that you would allow us to be disciplined enough to lay those aside for the moment, for the hour, so that we can give you all the the undivided attention so that you can be first in our lives and thus allowing us to uh, take deep into your word those truths that will matter for time and eternity that will transform us little by little into the likeness of Christ and so now Father thank you for hearing our prayers and help us again through God the Holy Spirit to instruct us and to illuminate the truths that we're going to look at we ask and pray these things through Christ's matchless name Amen Okay, the passage that we're going to look at, we're not going to spend a lot of time because, like I said, we only have two pages, and then we will just go right through it, okay? So Hebrews chapter 10, 35 and 36 says the following, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Great reward. So the confidence in Scripture has to the idea of the ability to know without a shadow of a doubt that you know it's going to come to pass. When you think of biblical hope, it's an utmost confidence in God, confidence in His Word. And like we saw last night, there's a time to put reliance upon Jesus Christ, which is the living Word, but there are times when you are to put reliance upon the written Word, doctrine. So depending on the circumstance, depending on what we're talking about, will determine and will allow us to see Am I supposed to trust in Jesus Christ or am I supposed to trust in His Word? That makes all the difference sometimes in the daily activities of a believer. And so if you don't know what you're going to do, then you may misplace your faith. Sometimes it's not about placing your faith in Jesus Christ, the living Word. Sometimes it's about placing your faith in the written Word. So if you don't know the difference, then you're going to be in a lot of trouble. You're going to be... You're going to be like a a yo-yo. You're going to be going back and forth, not knowing what needs to take place in your life, which is why sometimes we fall apart, we implode. We're not clear on what needs to be done because we're not consistently in Bible doctrine. And if that's the case, then you're going to have a very difficult time executing the spiritual life. So look at what the author of Hebrews says here. Notice how I said the author because we're not sure who the author is. There are speculations, like it could be the Apostle Paul, it could be someone else. And so, I don't think it's Paul, but I can't prove it one way or the other, but just know that I'll specifically say when we hit anything from Hebrews, that the author of Hebrews says the following. He says, therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. So the author is saying, look, you have confidence, okay? But don't chuck it out the window. Don't forget about it. Don't give up because it has great reward. For if you have need of endurance, well, then fine. But don't chuck it out the window so that after you have done 
the will of God, you may receive the promise. So the promise which is etched throughout the scripture that applies to the church age believers will be yours over time as you execute and you endure with great patience those things that are trying to rob you of your confidence as found in 35. So 35 and 36 are uh, wedded together so that you can see the flow of the author's thoughts here. Don't cast away your confidence. Don't give up. 35 says don't give up. 36 says don't give up. If you need endurance, fine. Get endurance. Get it in the word. So that after you have endured, which is a part of the will of God, you may receive the promise. Okay, And so Hebrews talks about uh, this peace, this peace that the Israelites failed to acquire because they gave up. And so they didn't reach the promised land. They didn't get to experience anything. It wasn't until the second generation of the Israelites that they were able to experience some of the things that they could have experienced earlier, their fathers or forefathers, but because of sin and disobedience, they did not get to experience what they could have experienced. And likewise, we can experience the promises in our lifetime, as long as we don't cast away our confidence, which has great reward. And if the author says, if you need endurance, if you need patience, well, check out what the Word of God says. Check out what Hebrews says. Don't give up persevere that's the whole that's a, a big part of Hebrews and that's a big part of the New Testament another way of saying <coughs> this these two verses is found in the NLT translation let me read it to you now don't throw away this confident trust in the Lord remember the great reward it brings you and then he says in 36 patient patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. So if you don't endure, you're not going to receive the promise as stated in Hebrews, as well as the other epistles and the other books of the New Testament. I specifically say the New Testament because there's nothing in the Old Testament outside of Genesis chapter 3 where we're promised a Savior that is recorded for the church age believers. I mean, maybe some of the prophetic, uh, the prophetical things in Daniel and Isaiah and a few other places, but those relate to the millennial kingdom, a future, but a lot of the promises in the Old Testament relate specifically to Israel. We have to separate the promises that relate to Israel and the promises that relate to the church. The promises that are geared towards the church age believers, that, which include you and I, are found you specifically in the New Testament primarily from Romans on okay so that's the passage that that's the two verses I wanted you to see don't throw away this confident trust in the Lord because that's one way the world will know that we have a relationship with the living God we have confident trust in him remember that the great reward it brings you or remember the great great reward it brings you and patient endurance is what you need now we all do, right? None of us are impervious to the stressors of life, the problems of life, the challenges of life. But we need endurance, which is what you need now, so that you will continue in God's will. And that's interesting because these past several months, if not longer, reminds us in these two verses that we need endurance so that we can continue in what? God's will. So if you don't have the endurance... If you don't have the doctrine stored up in your soul, if you don't know that this is a part of life, this is a part of the Christian walk, this is a part of the spiritual advance, then you're not going to continue to do God's will. You see that in 36? Patient endurance is what you need now. You don't need more money. You don't need more comfort. You need more endurance that will allow you to do God's will, God's purpose for your plan and your life so that you can execute what it is that he specifically has for you. And guess what he has for you next week? He has a new study for you. It's called, I put it in the chat box. Let me see if you can see it. Oh, it got cut off, I believe. Let me see. Um, if you go to rbtheme.org, 
Let me see if I have it on my other device. Oh, I don't have it here. Let me see. I'll just put it on the chat box anyways. But I had the link for you. Well, let me do this later on. I want to get through the study. I want to get through what I had promised we are going to cover because we've been covering the last two pages for several weeks now, but rightfully so because the, the content is meaty, in my opinion. So that's Hebrews 10, uh, 35 and 36. Don't throw away this confident trust in the Lord. You need that. Patient endurance is what you need. You need that now. Why? So that you will be able to continue to do God's will. And when you do, you will receive all that He has promised. It's all there for you and for me. And so we need that. We need the patience. We need the endurance. We need that confident trust that only comes through a saturated mind that's with God's Word or Bible doctrine. So that's the two verses I wanted to open up with. And now, oh, there you go, right there from the chat box is the, the link to the um, book, rbtheme.org, The Plan of God, that's what we'll need next week. So please download that, and I should be able to send you a, a, an email or a mess uh, the link on Messenger as well, just in case I'll do that anyways. So now let's go to our page. This is page 28. Growth and maturity, we're going to hit two pages, 28 and 29. So with 28, growth and maturity, listen closely, okay? Spirituality and carnality are absolutes. In other words, you're either spiritual or you are carnal. Carnal means you're walking in the flesh, you're no longer in fellowship with God, you're no longer empowered by God, the Holy Spirit. And when you're living like that, you, you're going to notice that you're not, your sensitivity towards the things of God, your concern for other people's welfare are just going to tank. You don't care. You're going to be like, well, I don't really care. What about me? What about me? It's going to be the I, like the iPhone, the I me. It's just me. You're not going to be worried or concerned about ministry. You're not going to be concerned about church. You're not going to be concerned about Bible studies because you're fragmenting slowly but surely and you're going to notice that you're irritable you're just so short and you know spiritual things are just not the way it used to be for you it's going to be like well they'll understand i'm just you know i don't want to today and that may be true maybe you've got a cold maybe you've got a headache maybe you're just not into it anymore but i'm telling you take my word on this that if you're not consistently taking in Bible doctrine, if you're not consistently in the Word, hitting it consistently, then you're not going to have the, abil the, set, the, the discernment to notice when you're deviating and slowly in reversionism or backsliding, and then that later on it's going to be too late to say, oh, how did I get this far? It's kind of like the prodigal son when you just stay away long enough you're, you're not going to be close to the father anymore and you're not going to be concerned about his feelings you're not going to be concerned about what is most inter what he's most interested in because like the prodigal son you're going to be like well i just want to be happy so give me what belongs to me and i'm out of here look at the two versions of the sons one said i'm out of here because i want to do what i want to do i don't care about the the niceties of this home anymore. I'm not too concerned about the, the promises of God anymore. I don't care that you're watching over me, Father. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I'm out of here. Give me what belongs to me, and I'm out of here. Give me what belongs to me. I'm saved eternally. I just want to know that I'm saved. I just want to know that I'm going to heaven. I just want to know. I just want to know me, me, me. And you saw, if you notice the story of the prodigal son, even the older brother had the same attitude, but just in a slightly different tilt. And his attitude was, when his brother came back, he was upset at the father. And did you ever notice what his, the older son said? How come you never gave me anything so that I can spend it with my friends? So he was angry at his father. And he, he, he instead said, you know what? You're throwing a party for my son, or your son, and he calls him son, 
because he detached himself as a brother. He said, your son, you throw a party, you, you're killing a, a fatted calf or a fatted pig for him. You're celebrating his return. I have never wronged you. I've been there by your side doing all the things that you expected from me. Did you ever give me a fatted calf or, any, or a lichon so that I can party with my friends? I don't think so. And so you can see the extremes. The son wanted everything up front, whereas the older brother said, well, you know what? I've been here all this time. You don't even recognize me. You don't even pat me on the back. You don't even say, good job. And here I am sweating it out every single year. And now this son of yours who comes back, lives it up with prostitutes, you're throwing a party for him and you didn't even bother to at least thank me and said, you know what, my son, I'm so proud of you. You never ran away. You never asked for what rightfully belongs to you. And here, let's throw a party for you and your friends. Did you ever do that for me, Father? You have two extreme versions of reversionism. The oldest son versus the younger son. I'm not really sure who did the worst sin of all, but they're both in the wrong, clearly in the wrong. I state this because this is the, the absolute of carnality or spirituality. Spirituality, as I've said before, is when you're properly adjusted to God, the Holy Spirit. And if you're in carnality, you're going to be able to discern that just because you're not going to have the peace, you're not going to have the stability, you're not going to have the joy of the Lord. Those w words are rich with, me with meaning. And if you don't pause for a moment and say, why am I not experiencing this, then you're missing out. See, so I'm not saying, how come I don't have the joy of the Lord? But you should ask yourself, how come when it comes to ministry, Bible studies, church, how come I don't look forward to it the way that I used to? Or, you know, what can I do to really make things ironed out here? Because, you know what, this is... This is the Lord's work. This is something that God obviously wants me to be a part of. And if you don't have that mentality, you're not really having that joy of the Lord, in my opinion. Because you know, even it, it's hard for me, but I'm sitting here saying, well, you know, we got to make this work because this is his church. This is his ministry. This is his Bible class. This is his Bible studies. You don't think for a moment that I could say to I could say to you all that you know what there's a three hour time difference why don't you guys wake up earlier and let's just meet at 4 p.m. instead you know and I'll start at 7 p.m. and that way I'll be able to take care of my health and I can manage my my health a little better because I don't have the best sleep and I have uh, at mo um, bouts of insomnia from time to time and I use a CPAP machine and so you know what, I could, I could say they should adjust to me. I never have that attitude. Why? Because my view is like this, and I'm sharing this so that you can see how Pastor Freddie rolls with God. Instead of saying, well, they have to adjust to me because of my health, and they should know, if I, if I go back in time and say, do you guys rem remember this, 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 and that? You remember what happened to me in 2018? Do you remember that? I could, I could lean into that and say, I can give you all the reasons why we should make adjustments. In fact, I'm adding another study because I'm throwing another, I'm going to open a study here. Why? Because it's maximum exposure for both sides, both ministries. And what keeps me going? It's not because, oh, well, you know, they don't understand these guys here. Are obviously they don't care about my health guys in California they obviously don't care about my health I don't even say that at all I don't think like that at all you know I sit there and I tell Karina I said you know she says well isn't this gonna be too hard is it you think you can handle it? I said you know what I will handle it not do I think I can I will why because my attitude is I do all things as unto the Lord and when you have that attitude and you're in the mode of spirituality because you're properly adjusted to God, the Holy Spirit, there's no limits. There's no limits. I'm on fire and I'm excited to do this. And I think if you're not having it from that perspective, I'm not saying you have to. I'm not saying 
you have to be pumped up and fired up every single time but I'm telling you if you don't have that well you know what this is God's ministry then you're gonna wind up just fragmenting and saying well why even bother why even bother because he doesn't do anything she doesn't do anything and it's all about pointing fingers when in fact you should be recognizing that we rise and fall before the master himself and that's the secret to having a thriving life of spirituality rather than carnality. So let me press on or else we're going to drag on again. So at any given moment, you'll either be 100% filled with the spirit or 100% filled by the sin nature, or controlled by the sin nature. You cannot be partially spiritual or partially carnal, nor can you be both spiritual and carnal at the same time. You can't be both spiritual and carnal. Uh, living for God and living for self. It doesn't work. In fact, what, we're, what we commonly hear is you can't serve God and mammon at the same time. You can't serve God and money at the same time. So likewise, from a doc doctrinal perspective, you can't serve, you can't be filled with the spirit and, fill, and filled with the, the sin nature at the same time. In, in other words, you can't be doing both at the same time. You can't be operating from the flesh while at the same time filled with the Spirit. You can't. They're both absolutes. You're either one or the other. Which is why the only way you can be completely in tune with God, willing to rock and roll, roll for God, and be at peace with it, and recognizing that whatever sacrifice I make, you make, we make, it's for Him anyways. So we don't have to wonder, well, what about Him? What about her? Well, why can't Freddie make the adjustment? I'm willing to make the adjustment. In fact, I think I have. I've made all the adjustments n needed to make sure that you win. We win. They win. We all win. And ultimately, God is pleased. Because my aim is not to please you. My aim is not to please the church here. My aim ultimately is to please God. That's what keeps me going. You want the answer and the antidote to um, an ongoing fire ministry that's nonstop? 100% go for the gusto. You serve your Lord and you do all things as unto the Lord, not because of him or her, not because of me, but because of him, uppercase him, uppercase H, God himself. If you're not going to do it for anybody else, then you're going to be rotten and miserable. You're not going to want to do anything, I assure you. I used to do that myself. I, when I first started in ministry, it was like, well, how come no one even appreciates how I preach or what I do and do this and do that? And I, I would travel to meet them and counsel them and go meet at Starbucks, go meet at Denny's. They don't even appreciate me. They don't even help me with my gas. They don't even realize that as a pastor, I don't get much. And so why, Lord? Why is it even worth it anymore? They don't even thank me at the end after staying there till two o'clock in the morning. I go home nearly crash because I'm tired. And they don't even thank me. That was my attitude. I said, well, it wasn't until I realized that I don't do that for them. I don't do that for that couple. I don't do that for the people at church. I do what I do as unto God. And if I have that right, proper perspective, then I can do anything through Christ who strengthens me. And if you don't have that attitude, then ministry is going to tank out. You're going to just say, Shh. breaks are going to come on. You're going to say, I... This is getting old. I, I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah, I'm tired of doing this. I'm tired of doing I'm, I'm tired of doing hospitality. I'm tired of doing the worship team. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired of setting up this, setting up that, setting up the music, setting up the speakers, setting up the sound for Pastor Freddie every time he comes there. I'm, I'm tired. I drive from a long distance. I drive all the way there. I, I, it consumes a lot of gas. And then only to say that we're here, we're in the cove. And I don't know, I'm, this is getting old. So if you all are thinking like that, I assure you, it's going to get very old. And the antidote to that is, first of all, who are you doing this for? Are you doing it for the Lord? Are you doing it for Gladys? Are you doing it for Rudy? Or are you doing it for Pastor Freddie? That's not the right perspective. I don't want you to do it for me. I want you to do what I'm doing. We're doing it for the Lord. If we have that mentality, then it doesn't matter whether we have 10 5, 15, or 16, is God pleased by our efforts? And I would say yes. And then is that sufficient enough? Yes, yes, and yes. 
So if you're not locking shields and jumping on board, you're not a part of the team even though you're there. You have to put him first and put him first above all things. And if you do, then first of all, you're going to say you're going to get rewarded for that. And that's not the only reason why we do it. But we do it because we want to do what's right. We want the benefic- we want to be beneficiaries of peace, answered prayer, empowerment that comes only from God, and all these other blessings that come as a result of spirituality, which is why I've been so hard on phase two salvation. So now he goes on to say, on the other hand, spiritual growth is relative, bottom of 28, or this page here, 21. A believer gradually matures just as a child gradually becomes an adult. The moment you accept Christ as Savior, you become a son of God. Galatians 4, 4 to 7. The Greek word huios means an adult son. This is the top circle, your position in Christ. However, experientially, you are called a brephos. 1 Peter 2, verse 2. The Greek word refers to a baby at the mother's breast. When a person is 50 year old, 50 years old and he believes in Christ as Savior he is physically an adult but spiritually he's a brand new baby he goes on to say if he grows spiritually by assimilating and metabolizing Bible doctrine he will soon become a spiritual adolescent he's growing 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 just going into adulthood Matthew 4 4 if he continues to grow he will eventually become a mature Christian but notice it's a progressive it's a progressiveness it's not something that's automatic it's progressive it's contingent upon growing it's contingent upon assimilating and metabolizing Bible doctrine you can't do it any other way you can't just say I'm gonna pray to be more mature it doesn't do, it doesn't work that way <clears throat> He says, this is a second concept of experiential Christianity. The relative progression of spiritual growth is closely related to the absolute status of spirituality versus carnality. A believer, whether a baby, adolescence, or mature, is either spiritual or carnal at any moment. Did you hear that? You're either spiritual or carnal at any moment, whether you're a baby, adolescence, or a new believer. How is that? How can a baby be spiritual? Well, if a baby is influenced by God the Holy Spirit because of confession of sin, it doesn't matter if he's a baby in Christ. If I came to faith tonight, then I could be spiritual. It's not because I'm involved with 10 studies or I'm going to a retreat or doing this and doing that and I'm, I'm wearing certain clothes, I'm, I'm parting my hair to the side, I'm looking holy. It has nothing to do with the external. It has everything to do with Am I properly aligned to God the Holy Spirit? Because if I am through confession of sin, now my status is spirituality. I'm now spiritual. I'm now aligned with God the Holy Spirit, thus able to experience the empowerment that comes from God the Holy Spirit. But if I short circuit that through sin, even as a baby in Christ, I can fix that and rectify that right there on the spot. I don't have to spend years and years of walking in the Spirit I just have to confess my sin right then and there. When I do, my status now is spirituality. But when I commit a sin as a baby, I'm now in carnality. So whether I'm carnal or spiritual, it depends on what I do with sin. If we take care of sin and eradicate sin, as far as our broken fellowship is concerned, through 1 John 1, 9, that determines if I'm spiritual or not. So it doesn't take long. It takes fraction of a second, maybe less than 10 seconds. Father, forgive me. Not forgive me. Father, I'd sinned. I did this. I had a bad thought. I said a bad word. That was wrong. You're right. Your word is right. I'm wrong. I fall short. Thank you for the grace that's mine in Christ. And once I acknowledge my sin to God, boom, fellowship has been restored. Sin has been covered. It already has been covered, but it's been dealt with already. Okay. So it goes on to say, So while a believer, whether baby, adolescent, or mature, is either spiritual or carnal at any moment, depending on whether God the Holy Spirit or the sin nature controls his soul or influences his soul, while a temporary lapse into carnality 
demands the rebound technique, it does not immediately erode the believer's level of growth. So you're still growing, it's just having a lapse. The, believer's gr the believer greatly benefits by keeping short accounts with God, 1 John 1, 9. By promptly rebounding to restore the filling of the Spirit, the more time the believer is filled with the Spirit, the greater his opportunity to learn and apply Bible doctrine, and the more rapid his spiritual growth. In the church age, we have a new commandment that replaces the Mosaic law. Keep on being filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18, Matthew 22, 6-40, Galatians 5.22-23. Obedience in this new mandate is necessary in order to fulfill the second basic command, which is to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3.18. Again, that is a command. Grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. So how are you doing in that area? That's a direct command. That's not my responsibility. That's our responsibility. But you are to be growing in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. When you accurately understand these two imperatives or two commands, in other words, you are on your way in the Christian life. But until you understand them, your Christian life will be frustrated. There's that word frustrated again. As I've been saying repeatedly, you're going to be frustrated, you're going to be angry, you're going to be irritable. You're just going to be the most miserable. You're going to be just hating life. I don't want to be a part of this anymore. I'm going to stop going to these studies because he keeps telling me I'm, I'm wrong. I'm not saying that. I'm not, he keeps telling me to study. I'm not saying that either. The Word of God is saying that. I'm repeating what the Word of God says. So, many Christians are eternally saved, but do not know. They don't know it. They feel they have done something to lose their salvation. These are carnal believers who do not understand eternal security or the persistence of the sin nature in their lives. Yet, there's nothing the believer can do to lose his salvation. I know we drove that home um, quite hard. You can't lose your salvation. It's irrevocable, remember? This is no failure, there's no failure, no sin that can cancel the work Christ had accomplished on the cross. We can all say amen to that. The question is, how do you know you are saved? Have you believed in Christ by faith alone? If you have, boom, you're in. Then you are saved. How do you know you are carnal or spiritual? Well, have you rebounded? Have you confessed your sin? Then you are spiritual. Your awareness of salvation and the filling of the Holy Spirit comes by means of faith perception, believing in the gospel and the doctrines of the Word of God as taught by the mentor, God the Holy Spirit. Faith perception makes the power of the Holy Spirit and the spiritual life a reality in your thinking. You don't have to wonder, will it ever happen to me? Can I ever get as good as Pastor Freddie? You could surpass me. I'm not good anyways. The only thing that's good about me is that I'm trying to obey God. I'm trying to fulfill what he has called me to do. And if I'm doing my job, then it's I'm making the doctrines and the teachings available. Am I perfect? No. Do I fall short? All the time. But am I willing to serve God with, with my last breath and my breath that I currently have? Yeah. Why? Because he's worthy. He's given me life plus more, and I wake up every day thinking, what else can I do to bring him honor and glory? Not too many people think like that. Not too many people are wondering how can they please the living Lord. And to me, that's a shame. And I often would say, why would they not want to? God has spared them from accidents galore. God has spared them from life-challenging situations, accidents that they recall they could have died from, but no, God has spared people from that. God has spared me from that. God has spared you numerous times. When you go to the store, you could have got gunned down the other day. You could have been at the mall when people were chucking hammers at people trying to kill them, trying to steal Gucci bags and jewelry. But you weren't there at that time because God spared you. Maybe that delay was so that you won't be there in the wrong time, at the wrong time. So, you're, you're in the realm of spiritual phenomena, reality is not what you feel, what you assume not what tradition has taught you, but the Bible doctrine that the Holy Spirit teaches you. For we, are, for we walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Seeing that His divine power, which is the filling of the Holy Spirit, has granted to us 
everything pertaining to life and godliness, which is spiritual life, through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. 2 Peter 1.3 So this is where we will conclude and we're done with the study, finally. But let me just repeat the 2 Corinthians 5.7 because this is, I think, should be foundational uh, to all of us. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Don't let the circumstances of life get you down. Don't give up. If you need endurance, get it. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. And remember, we pull together. We are a family. The person, Rod's a part of the family. Steve's a part of the family. Karen is a part of the family. Rudy's a part of the family. Fred Sr. is a part of the family. Pi is a part of the family. My brother's a part of the family. And who else do we have here? Um, Jen is a part of the family. Winston, TJ, uh, Theda, Tess, uh, Ruben, Gladys. All of you are a part of the family of God. And so we should be mixing with each other, even if it's just online, and uh, figuring out ways that we can communicate or you can communicate with each other and just see what you can do to encourage the friendship more and more because we're family and I tell you there's not too many people who are believing what we currently believe now because uh, the way things are going uh, around the world I can tell you that um, very few people will accept doctrine as a way of life they, they just say it's too hard and it's too dry and I don't like to dig deep and talk about oh the spiritual life you know I as long as I have Jesus as long as I'm born again as long as I pray to Jesus I'm okay no you're not okay you're missing the point after salvation you're supposed to advance after salvation you're to continually grow in the knowledge and the wisdom of God grow in the grace and the knowledge of God that's the imperative that's one of the direct commands and in grace and you ought to be doing the work of, the, of an evangelist that's not optional my friends that's a part of who we are God has saved you for that very purpose and we're going to learn more starting next week from uh, based on the study the plan of God but don't ever think that just because you're saved that's it that's the mentality of the world if you think about it you know, as long as I can eat, I can put food, food on the table, take care of my family, I'm fine. That's not the Christian life. That's not the spiritual life. If you're thinking like that, you're thinking with the, the perspective of the human, the natural man. You've lost touch with God, my friend, if that's all you think. As lo if, if you're thinking like, well, as long as I'm putting money, in, uh, on the, putting food on the table, I'm able to take care of myself, take care of my wife, my husband, my kids, and so on and you know advance here advance there you're not on the on the same team you're not on the God's you're not on God's team and I I mean what I'm saying what I mean by that is you're supposed to go and make disciples of all nations all people that's what you're supposed to be doing that's not optional there are so many things that's why when people used to say oh you're still covering salvation yes because I can tell not everyone is getting it they think they're getting it, but by the time we slide into phase two, they're still saying, well, phase one, yeah, you know, I'm born again. But they don't know the intricacies and the complexities of all these other things that relate to phase two, salvation. And they, they say, oh, I get it now. How come he's still doing that? Well, it's because the person may be thinking, I get it now, but if I ask them directly, what's the difference between abiding and believing? What do you have to do to abide? What's the difference between placing your faith in the Word of God and placing your faith in Jesus Christ? When's the time to place your faith in Jesus Christ versus the Word of God? See? That's something we covered last night. That's the doctrines that we accumulatively study consistently each and every week. Tuesdays and Wednesdays. We're hitting it multiple to twice a week. Then we top it off on Sunday with end time events. So we're offering as a ministry as a church as a as a pastor 
I'm always looking for people who is not satisfied with status quo. Because if you're not satisfied with status quo, you, you jump on board and you hang with me. And you're going to get lots and lots of doctrine. You're going to see. And I'm not even saying you stop doing what you're doing. If you're, like, I know Ruben and uh, Rudy goes to multiple studies. Keep doing that. That's, that's, your, that's your prerogative. I'll never tell you to stop doing anything. But what you will see is over time, you're going to see that the teachings are going to put focus on different things. And so there's going to be a cutoff point where you're going to say, okay, I know what this person is teaching, and I know what Pastor Freddie is teaching, and there's a consistency with what Pastor Freddie is teaching, and it's, it's really different. Now I can see the difference. And that is what I'm talking about as far as the doctrinal perspective from these Bible doctrine churches. Because it's a unique perspective when it comes to the systematic theology, the biblical doctrines, the exegetical approach to the Word of God. Because when, when you study the Word of God, there are certain truths that come out only through an ice method, an isagogical method. Hermeneutical, I have a specific hermeneutic when approaching the Bible, and there's a pattern that allows me to lift the truth out from the Word. And when you have books like this that have done the homework, a lot of the books that we're using, they've done their homework, so we don't have to go and rehash every single thing. I might just look from time to time a certain verse and say, okay, well, I might not agree 100% on what he's saying, the way he's saying it, and then I'll sometimes add my two cents. And that's why a lot of times we go overtime, because when someone will say something, I'll add my two cents. And I, I know you've noticed that. It's not to say because this pastor is wrong or this teacher is wrong. It's just that I might say, like, for, I'll give you a good example, and then we'll move on to questions. You've heard me say numerous times, well, our, our theme or whoever will say, whoever's controlled by the Spirit of God, right? Whoever's controlled, who's ever controlled. And instead of saying controlled by the Spirit, I'll say what? Who's ever influenced by the Spirit? Because I've adopted a newer, when I was still in Schaefer Seminary before they moved, um, the final assessment and analysis of the spiritual life was instead of saying controlled by the Spirit, the new terminology is influenced by the Spirit. The reason being is because if the Holy Spirit can control you to do the right thing, would He not make you do the right thing all the time? I mean, how can you break the grips of, from God the Holy Spirit if He's controlling you? If God, In other words, if God is controlling you, how can you exercise your free will? You can't. So therefore, instead of saying, when God the Holy Spirit is controlling you, it's preferred to say when the Holy Spirit is influencing you. That gives freedom for volition. Now, does that mean that Schaefer and all these other guys were wrong? Not at all. It's just over time, things get refined. Things get, uh, terminology and choice of verb words will be modified to adapt to the subtle nuances that are discovered over time, a better way of saying the same thing slightly differently, but more in keeping with the consistency as what we're seeing in the scripture. It takes a lot of time, but that's why when we go through these studies, when we go through the passages up front, when we open the word, we start with the word, you're getting seminary training basically on the fly. And so it's not every single detail right then and there, that night, tonight, last night. But you'll see, kind of like looking behind the pastor's shoulder kind of approach. That's why we'll look at a verse. We'll say, what do you see? And I'll, I'll sometimes use it. I use the NLT sometimes, but that's not the best study method. But I'll make sure that we use the New King James, and I'll make sure that my answer as I'm answering it and throwing in my two cents will be consist <coughs> consistent with what I see in the original text. And, and the New King James is fairly straightforward and consistent with the word-for-word -word translation from the Greek text. And that's why I like to use it. The, my, my seminary um, really 
is gung ho about New King James, and so anyways, that that's beside the point. I will now open it up for some questions. You may not have any questions, but you might. So if you do, just um, let me know what you say, what you think, and see, we did it. I told you we would do it. What do you think about that, guys? I, I was able to pull it off. I ended on time. Uh, well, it's two minutes now, but uh, I did finish the book. I told you we would finish the book. So we should celebrate. See, God answers prayers. So any thoughts or comments? Anybody? Yeah. Can we uh, say influence in faith influence the faith influence faith uh yeah you you that that would be safe <laughs> yeah influencing good yeah influencing yeah, I'm trying to, yeah i'm trying to well to I, use it uh uh totally the answer mm -hmm. well uh, mm -hmm. yeah yeah, I, I was just thinking about that. Yeah, it could influence the faith. It could he could be influencing us to have faith in him, have faith in God. Mm -hmm. So that can certainly work. So what I'm saying is, sometimes you'll see in the book, uh, or you'll hear, you'll hear people say, "Well, when God the Holy Spirit controls you, uh, then if you're walking by the Spirit, then you can't do anything except have the fruits of the Spirit in your life." But the truth is, we could be spiritual after 1 John 1, 9, but we may not exhibit the fruit of the Spirit because that's something that is going to take place over time. And by the way, whose fruit is it? It's not Freddie's fruit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. So I'm using the, the term control uh, very carefully because the Holy Spirit... When we say he controls us, then we, we are devoid now of our volition. Because he's going to want to control us to only do what is right. That means we don't have any wiggle room. We don't have any exercise of our volition. So therefore, it's better, in my opinion, based on what I've learned, instead of saying the Holy Spirit controls you, I think it's better to say that the Holy Spirit influences you. So, because we have the tug of war, we just saw and read that you're either carnal or you're spiritual. If you're carnal, what's controlling you? What's influencing your sin nature? That's right. See? So it's the sin nature that's controlling you. But if the Holy Spirit is influencing you, you are now taking an interest in the spiritual things of God and He's influencing you. But if He's controlling you, He's going to grab me by the neck and say, study your words, study the doctrine, study the Bible. You see? So, but we have free will, so therefore he's not controlling us. I mean, if he wanted to control me, I'll be hitting the Bible every single minute, probably. He'll say, you're a pastor, so you need to stay in here longer. Don't worry about sleeping. Stay up all night. But he doesn't, because I have free will still. So therefore, I think it's better to say he influences us. So as yeah. I'm confessing my sins, now he has free reign to influence me. Because if I'm carnal, he has nothing to do with that. But when I confess my sins, he can now influence me. He's no longer grieved. So that's proof that we have free will. That's proof that the Holy Spirit can influence us. And that's in keeping with Genesis 3. God never controlled Adam and Eve. He could have, because that's the big question. Why did God, if God knew that Adam and Eve were going to sin, why did he allow them? See? So. Hi, hi Data. I see you there. It's always yeah, when good. When you said about. Uh -huh, go ahead, Rudy. Oh, uh, yeah. When you said about the, uh, Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. in that time, uh, the, the snake was uh, the, the, uh, Satan went with the snake that's right he was uh, yeah. possessed okay. the snake and then 
in that situation, mm -hmm. Satan is roaming around in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. Am I, am right. I clear, clear, clear with that? Yes, you are clear with that. So he, God allowed him to roam around. That's right. He didn't control him. Yeah. See? Um, he could say, uh, even though he sins against him, mm -hmm. against God, yeah. he still he still have a little free will free feeling for that Satan mm -hmm. to let him go you know uh, yeah yeah I, I, I'm okay. trying to okay to, very good to understand <laughs> thank very you very good alright anybody else have any thoughts if not I will close in prayer and remember next week we oh let me for those who weren't there last night um I was chosen to continue to be interim pastor here in Virginia, and so what that means is um, I have agreed to continue to do status quo. Everything's going to remain the same. What they were looking for in a full-time pastor was uh, for me or the full-time pastor to do two morning services and uh, a midweek service and I, I declined I couldn't do that with all the responsibilities I have with Church of Hope and my health I did not want to assume more responsibility I wanted to keep a, a nice balance between the two ministries and uh, but I what I did agree to was I thought well you know while I'm here and since they chose me instead of the two other guys it since it defaulted to me um, I agreed to help out in the middle of the week and so initially I was just going to combine Tuesday and Wednesdays and make it a Tuesday night but then I decided because we're about to start a new study with our Wednesday study instead of meeting on Wednesdays on for our study here I'm just gonna ask that we move it to Thursday night same time so it won't inconvenience anybody so I'm willing to do it at 10 p.m. here, 7 p.m. there, or depending on where you are. If you're in the Philippines, obviously different. But that way we don't disrupt this study, uh, our new study, which is the plan of God. So we'll keep the Tuesday nights. We'll have a Thursday night instead of the Wednesday night. So we're just basically moving Wednesday to Thursday, same time. And so it, doesn't, it won't inconvenience you. We'll maintain a consistency. And when we're done with this that study, we'll start another one, just like what we normally do. So instead of combining Tuesday and Wednesdays and having two studies or trying to do two studies, it would be impossible. So I'm just going to do Wednesday nights on Thursday, and this is going to take place starting the week of the 27th. So please notate that on the 27th, and plus you'll get my text and message. The 27th is when we will start um, meeting on Thursday. Yeah. What's that, Rod? No, I mean Thursday. Yeah. Uh, September twenty seventh. Uh, that's next week already. Ne uh, no, not is it next week? Yeah. The twenty seventh. Yes. Oh. Yes. Okay, let me make sure. I think it is. You're right. Let me see. So yeah. This so meeting the twenty sixth and the twenty eighth. The twenty eighth. That's right. So the twenty eighth next week. The I'm starting the 27th next week for National Capital, and the 28th is when we'll start our new study on Thursday nights. I will send a link to you all for those who want to join me on the Wednesday nights here at National Capital. Now, they're having difficulty trying to figure out how they can do it the way that we're doing it because apparently it's reverberating like what we're experiencing in the, in the church in uh, when we meet in the middle and so in the sanctuary so uh, I'm not sure how it's going to work so it might be uh, camera on me hear the audio on zoom and then hear the people asking questions or interacting like that because they're not set up to do multiple windows the way that we have it I know we're doing it like this because we're all using computers uh, iPads cell phones but they are they're not doing it like that and they w would prefer to keep it the way it is now cuz they they don't have the ability they there's not they're not really tech savvy on this stuff and I don't want to uh, create unnecessary
problems for them. I, I did suggest maybe doing a, a cell phone thing, but that's going to do the same thing. It's going to echo. It's going to hear, you're going to hear echo, 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 if everyone there is using their phones. Um, so because it's working now, you're all in different locations. But if we are in the same room, you're going to get a lot of echoing and you're gonna, it's going to be loud. So, but I am going to see what we can do or what they can do. But again, I just, they're not set up to have it like this. So I don't know. I'll try to think of something too, but. but sorry, but yeah. we could listen in, right? You can listen in. You just, okay. you, you, you can listen in but we can't do what we're doing here with the multiple windows, like how it is here. I can see Winston, iPhone, Ruben, Rod, Gladys, Jen, Steve, Karen, Dad, Pi, George, uh, Theta, Rudy, Tess. Um, it's not gonna come out, it's not gonna be doable there because they have one youth Zoom link and that one computer doesn't toggle between all these windows. And, um, <laughs> Uh, I can help you, Pastor. You can? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, let me let me see. I, I don't know who's running the show there. I don't know who's going to be. They, they don't have very many people there who are really tech savvy. So uh, is it hard to do, Ruben? No. Nah, no. Nah. Okay. Uh, I don't know how it will work, but... Um, you probably have the experience, uh, Ruben. I can put this in uh, YouTube, Facebook, live on Facebook, live on YouTube, you know, all this stuff. You can? Yeah. From, from the link that we're going to send? Yeah, yes. Oh, wow, okay. Um, maybe well, I'll have... Maybe we could speak with whoever is doing the electronic stuff over at National. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll talk together. Okay, maybe I can connect Ruben with them. So I'll, yeah. I'll see. Let, but Let me time though. Yeah, there's a time difference too. So if they're gonna start at eight thirty, which will be five thirty your time. PM. Yeah. PM here. Yeah. So yeah. there's gonna be a time difference, and um, let me see. Um. Well, if they set it up, if they're able to get it set up, if, mm -hmm. if there's something we need to do here, mm -hmm. maybe we could do that part. I, I just, we just don't know how to get it all set up. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So maybe we could do this. We could see how it works on the first Wednesday, and then Ruben can probably assess it and see, oh, this needs to be done like this, this, this. And then I could connect them with the guy who's uh, working on the the Zoom there. Will that yeah, work? Yeah. Will that work, Ruben? So we'll try it out Wednesday next week, and then Ruben will get a he'll be able to see how they're doing it there, and then he'll say, okay, you got one Zoom, you got this, you got that. I can hear you, but it's echoing if you do this, that, that, and so maybe Ru Ruben will be able to say, oh, this is what you need to do. So if we're going to try to multi, you know, add more windows or make it interactive, because see what they're doing, Ruben, is if there's too many microphones, I think, it's going to echo on their speaker system. They have a speaker. Yeah. But yeah. before you join in, actually, in the Zoom, mm -hmm. you have to turn up the microphone already before you, zoom. you try to... Okay. 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 If, even though if you have multiple Zoom open, uh -huh. it, it won't be, it won't be uh, having some uh, uh, what you call this echo because it makes sure only one has the mic on mm -hmm. before joining in. So that's one thing. Okay. Make sure only one. Even though you're in the same room, make sure only one. Mm -hmm. One. One Zoom, the host most most probably the host will only be the only one using the microphone. Mm -hmm. The rest, all of the microphone is off before they they join in. The, the their microphone is already off. Okay. Yeah. Teda, were That's, you trying to say something, Teda? 
Oh, no, no, it's okay. Okay, okay. okay. I did. Okay. On. Okay. All right, well, let's try it. Uh, uh, we'll see how it goes next week, and then we'll try it from there, Ruben. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you'll just have to come down here and do some headlights. <laughs> so, all right. I can do headlights, too. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I paint, I paint cars, too. You do? <laughs> okay, very good. You do a good job. You do a good job. Yeah. yeah I... Visit me here the other day, yeah. Okay. All right, why don't we... Why don't we call it a night and close in a word of prayer and thank you, everyone. And uh, we will resume next week with uh, the plan of God. So I'll be sure to get the link out to you and I'll see if I can send the PDF via email and the messenger. But uh, for now, let's close in a word of prayer and thank you again for joining me uh, with these studies here. I, br I believe it brings honor and glory to God. So, Father, thank you as always for giving us this opportunity to examine your word. We know that this brings you honor, and we know that this is something that you approve of. There's not too many things you approve, but we know that you approve these kind of uh, activities. And so, Father, as children of God, we are striving for excellence. We are striving to bring you honor and glory. We know that your desire is to not only grow spiritually, but others would come to faith. We're living in a day and age where people are no longer sure about themselves. They're no longer sure as far as what's right and wrong. And so, Father, we need to continue to be a pivot where we are, being a light and salt to our friends, to our loved ones, so that it would not only bring you honor, but it will bring salvation to that person who is without Christ, without hope, and without salvation itself. So thank you for everyone's um, consistency here. We know that this is the only way to advance to higher grounds. And Father, I pray in a special way that you would bless each person that continues to join me like this and that you would keep them healthy and allow them to mature spiritually so that they can see truly that there's nothing better than advancing in the spiritual life. We ask and pray all of these things through Christ's matchless name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Eddie. Thank Bye you, wisdom. everyone. Bye, Ruby. Bye, Bye Rod. Everyone. Thank Good, night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.